All right, thank you so much, Vincenzo. This is Vincenzo yeah. Sorrentino from uh, NUS, one of our short talk speakers. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation. This is my first time in person here. It's a great event, so happy to be here and to share with you today. Sandero, I'm new NAD precursor, trigonelin, with uh, will muscle longevity uh, benefits across species. Just a small disclaimer, um, I used to work in SLA research, so most of the bulk of the experimental work that you will see today uh, was done when I was leading my research team over there. So, um, you have seen in the beautiful talks already all throughout these days that aging is basically characterized by the several uh, dysfunctional hallmarks that occur um, across different tissues and about possible interventions to target the aging hallmarks. What's also important to know that in the context of muscle aging, some of these hallmarks um, are also shared with sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle function and mass indeed associated with aging. From a clinical perspective, there are several um, uh, um, worldwide uh, aligned guidelines on how to define sarcopenia, and there are essentially three main parameters uh, used as indicators of muscle health. Gait speed, grip strength, and appendicular lean mass, which I will also use in the next slide, so keep these three parameters in mind. So recent work indeed before I joined uh, Nestle Research was trying to focus on how to characterize further looking at muscle biopsies, uh, sarcopenic hallmarks. But they did so by looking at uh, several cohorts uh, scattered across the globe. And in particular here, I'm showing the uh, sort of uh, clinical features of a uh, Singaporean cohort, where you can see here the three uh, clinical readouts of muscle health. And what they, um, what they did by uh, essentially looking at these two cohorts and looking at muscle biopsies, on one end is they found that the transcriptomics level and proteomics level downregulation mitochondrial function. However, what also emerged very clearly is that in the muscle of sarcopenic patients, NAD levels were declined. And importantly, although the uh, amount of samples here of muscle biopsies was low, uh, NAD levels were positively correlated with the three indicators of muscle health, so with gait speed, grip strength, and appendicular lean mass. Now, with this in mind, uh, when I joined uh, and uh, we launched the project as a follow-up to further characterize now uh, what could be systemic factors or, mo or molecules linked to what we have seen, especially considering the muscle levels of NAD were declined, uh, we uh, made uh, use of serum samples from the same Singaporean cohort from which we analyzed the muscle biopsies, and we tried to look at, for instance, metabolites that may be linked, for instance, to NAD, in particular vitamin B3-related um, uh, metabolites. And uh, looking at this, the only one that was significantly changed and in particular downregulated in the sarcopenic cohort was uh, this metabolite called trigonelline. Importantly, as for the NAD muscle, trigonelline levels in the serum also positively correlated with lean mass, grip strength, and walking speed. And uh, also very interestingly, when we looked at how the serum trigonelline levels were associating in a positive manner with, uh, um, uh, with pathways in the uh, muscle biopsies, what emerged by far is that the most positively enriched pathway was the Oxfos-related um, uh, genes. You can see here the enrichment on the uh, enrichment score plot and also here the uh, genes that are enriched in the particular gene set. So with this in mind, we decided to look further at what is actually trigonelline, how does it look like, and what are its properties. So actually, by looking at the structure of trigonelline, what emerges is that not, nothing more than a methylated form of nicotinic acid, or niacin, which is a known NAD precursor. It has also been, let's say, around or known to the, to the people for a long time already for its anti-diabetic effects. Essentially, in the context of several mouse models to ameliorate uh, metabolic syndrome. What's also important to know is that it's a molecule that is present in our bodies, but is actually largely produced in plants, such as fenugreek seeds, coffee beans, and so on. And in fact, actually, when you drink coffee, you will most likely get a spike of trigonelline in your plasma. Also, there is very early evidence from the 80s that, um, there were, that people have tried to uh, do biochemical characterization for whether there could be a possibility to demethylate trigonelline, and seems like the liver may be uh, able to do so and to generate nicotinic acid. So with this in mind, and having measured trigonelline in the serum of patients, we, before doing experiments, we wanted to really just do a very simple experiment, and there are two interesting um, things to notice here. So we wanted to test the stability of trigonelline in human serum. So we just spiked trigonelline at one millimolar at 37 degrees in serum, and we took along actually the two of the most famous NAD precursors currently on the market. Also, uh, you have seen the talk from Morton about NR and NNM, 
and we looked at the stability in, ser in serum. So trigonelline is very, very stable, and that's uh, interesting for us, and that's good to know. Um, however, uh, this is something that is known, and it's not a critic or anything. It's just to raise the awareness that although the NAD precursors, they do work, they do come with some complications. And especially for clinical translation, this is very relevant to keep in mind. So, uh, for instance, in RNNM, at two hours, they already significant decline in serum, and at 24 hours, they are largely gone. And if you look here at their structure, essentially, it's... Um, they uh, resemble each other, and in fact, you can see that, for instance, they release abundantly a uh, numb when uh, present in the serum. So again, this is just to keep in mind that for clinical translation, it's very important to measure and look at the NAD metabolome uh, when we provide um, uh, precursors. So with this in mind, having observed all these links between trigonelline, muscle, and uh, mitochondria, we wanted to look, we asked the question whether trigonelline could act as an NAD precursor in animal species and impact longevity and muscle health. We attempted to do so by using several models, and we started with the uh, human uh, primary uh, myotube cells shown here, by, uh, where we showed that trigonelline can dose uh, dependently increase NAD levels, and it actually even works in primary myotubes derived from sarcopenic patients, indicating that actually it's possible to have a response to trigonelline even if you may have sarcopenia. We then switched to C. elegans as a short-lived uh, animal model, and we saw that trigonelline can increase NAD levels or restore NAD levels to a more youthful state. And when we gavaged adult young mice with trigonelline for two hours, we observed a consistent increase in NAD levels across several tissues. Next, we wanted actually to uh, really uh, map the conversion route of trigonelline into the NAD uh, biosynthesis pathway. And here in this cartoon here, you, uh, there are some of the pathways that uh, also Evandro and Torin Finkel have mentioned. For instance, you have the prior pathway that makes use of nicotinic acid through the MPRT enzyme to, produ to produce NAD. And you have the salvage pathway, which uses NAM and uh, b uh, basically, or the NRK pathway through NR to generate NNM and uh, NAD. And this, uh, basically, the key enzyme here is NMPT, which you may have heard of before. So what we did here, we also leveraged the use of inhibitors such as FK66 for NMPT and 2-hydroxynicotinic acid that is essentially an inhibitor uh, for MPRT. And then we test this in the, uh, with or without supplementing the precursors. So what you see here in control conditions in the myotubes, when you supplement either an R or trigonelline, you get a nice increase in NAD levels. However, when we, you now co-treat with 2-hydroxynicotinic acid to block MPRT, trigonelline doesn't work anymore. And furthermore, when we now combine the two inhibitors and we, go, uh, we do perf extended experiments to induce NAD depletion with FK66, which is uh, known to occur in several cell types with this inhibitor, you can see that trigonelline and NR, they can nicely rescue NAD levels and even boost them further with NR, indicating that indeed uh, trigonelline does not seem to rely on the salvage pathway. But when we now co uh, combine the two inhibitors, trigonelline complete, uh, effects are completely abolished really supporting the idea that it makes use like the nicotinic acid of the press sandler pathway. Next, we wanted to couple the same experimental design that I mentioned you before for the NAD levels and keeping in mind the use of the inhibitors for the two pathways here, looking at mitochondrial function. In particular, we looked at mitochondrial membrane potential and mitochond maximal mitochondrial respiration. Again, due to NAD depletion, now in this case, you see that uh, the mitochondrial respiration readouts are declined but they are promptly rest uh, restored by either trigonelline and NR to comparable manners. But when we now combine FK866 with 2-hydroxynicotinic acid, trigonelline is not able to restore mitochondrial function as well anymore compared to NR that instead just works just fine because it can bypass the two uh, pathways. Next, we wanted actually to test the benefits, since that was our interest from the beginning, on muscle aging of trigonelline. We started again with the C. elegans, due to the fact that it's a short-lived animal, and we uh, uh, treated the worms from day one of adulthood, actually, to bypass any potential effect on development. When we looked at muscle fiber integrity, trigonelline was able to actually ameliorate the muscle aging, aging phenotype, and this was mirrored by actually an improvement in the mobility of the worms, because you see less paralysis here in blue in the worms over time compared to the control uh, condition. And very importantly, trigonelline was also able to extend lifespan, but it was doing so uh, with uh, relying basically on the expression of MPRT1, which is the worm ortholog for MPRT mammals. So indicating that our, there is an evolutionary conservation of the utilization of trigonelline for also muscle health benefits that requires the press pathway. 
Finally, we wanted actually to go back to mammalians, and uh, to do so, we uh, made use of two years old mice, uh, supplemented chronically with trigonaline for 12 weeks, and uh, at the end of the study, uh, after supplementation, we measured grip strength and in situ muscle force. This is a protocol essentially where you uh, take a muscle of interest, in our case we use the TA muscle, and then you force through electrical stimulations, repeated contractions of the muscle to induce muscle fatigue. So from this uh, uh, long-term treatment, it's, we got sort of two uh, kind of sets of phenotypes, if you want. On one end, uh, the lean mass was not impacted, and the peak force, so the maximal force that the mouse can do when you force the muscle to contract, was not changed. However, uh, the grip strength in these mice was, there was a small but significant rescue, and, now we're, and this was also mirrored by a, an Im improvement in the muscle fatigue uh, phenotype. You can see here that when you start um, uh, the repeated contractions in the muscle of the aged mice here in black, there is a steep decline in the amount of force that they can generate versus the uh, young mice here in gray, which do not, which recover much uh, easier in that sense. And here with trigonin, we sort of partially rescue this phenotype, showing here this intermediate um, uh, phenotype here in blue. So there is, of course, much more that we could discuss, but uh, time is short. So I want to uh, conclude by acknowledging uh, uh, all the people that helped us with their expertise, in particular my ex-collaborators Jerome Fage and uh, Mathieu Membre in Nestlé, the NUS uh, for uh, allowing me to start my team over there. And just as a disclaimer, in, uh, soon I will also be opening one or two PhD positions in the M Amsterdam UMC, thanks to the support of the VD grant. So for any interested students or candidates, just come to me. I will be also a poster in 93. And uh, just a reminder of the courses and the workshops that we will have in 2024 in Singapore. So join us if you can. Thank you. Um, we have time for a very, very, very short question, if there is one. Yes. Very short, very short. Why didn't you show NAD uh, replenishment in muscle Sorry? in the last experiment? Yeah, so we have done essentially, yeah, so in the chronic treatment, so we see actually what we see with, uh, with NR in the, in the humans in the cell report, uh, last some paper. So actually we see NAD going up in uh, all the tissues, but actually in the muscle, the, we reach a sort of like flattening at that stage, which is similar to what we see in humans 3D with NR for a chronic condition. So in that sense, we are mimicking in a way, because we see also the downstream metabolites, we are mimicking exactly what the other in signatures that NR, for instance, or the other precursor are doing. So the muscle, when treated chronically, always tends to level out on the NAD. But acutely, you see it, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Great yeah. talk. Thank you. <laughs>